please welcome Richard Plepler with Henry Blodgett. Thanks, everybody. Um, so, Richard, seven years ago, everybody thought Netflix was a complete joke. You were the gorilla in the industry. I, I did Three, not think Netflix was a complete joke. A lot of people did. Yeah. People less smart than you or less prophetic than you. Then, two or three years ago, suddenly Netflix blows past you. You're the old dinosaur HBO in trouble, doesn't have the retail model that Netflix has. This year, I look at your last quarter, you have 12% subscriber revenue growth for a business that's supposed to be dying. You are incredibly alive all around the world. What's going on? Why, why are you not dead? So I think, I think uh, yes, rumor, what was Twain's great line? You know, r rumors of our uh, demise were quite premature. Um, so I think a couple things are going on. Um, we took a look at the marketplace uh, five years ago and everybody thought we were kind of locked in at 30% penetration. And I asked a simple question of, of the team and of some uh, pollsters who we brought in, which is, are, are we so in love with ourselves that we just assume that everybody out there knows what this brand is, that everybody out there just assumes they understand what's in our library? And I think maybe we're wrong about that, and there's a kind of undecided vote out there. And if we explained it to them better, would that matter and would that enable us to get closer to 50%, maybe 60% penetration in the country? And the, the, the research came back and said, look, your instinct is exactly right. There is a huge undecided vote out there. They don't understand what's in your library. They don't understand you have 3,000 hours of programming. They don't know the range of your content. They don't realize you have four Hollywood movie studios, first pay window. They don't get all that. And so at that moment, there were only, say, beginning of 13, 5 million broadband-only homes in the United States. We hypothesized that was obviously going to move exponentially. And if we could talk directly to our consumer and then we could convince our partners in the traditional ecosystem that there was gold in the hills and we could motivate them to package and market us, we saw a real opportunity for growth. So that's why we built our streaming service. That's why when we negotiated our uh, deals with uh, our partners over the course of the last uh, 18 months, two years, we built deals that drove scale and were motivated to give them an opportunity to drop their net effective rates that they were paying us. We understood that the wholesale rate and the retail rate of HBO had essentially gone as high as it could go without running out of runway. And what we wanted to do is incentivize our partners so that they could see the opportunity in getting to 50% and above with penetration. So we did both of those things over a two year period. And the dig on us when we did it was I, I remember my, my, uh, my, my friend Rich Greenfield saying on Investor Day in 14, well, what do you guys know about technology? You're not gonna be able to do it. And two, even if you do do it, you're gonna cannibalize your core business. And we said, well, give us an opportunity to partner with the right people, we'll build a streaming service, it'll work. And by the way, it won't be cannibalistic, it'll simply increase the pot. And fortunately, that's exactly what's happened. And we're on track. Uh, for our biggest year uh, in history in terms of subscriber revenue growth. And I see uh, that revenue curve just growing uh, over the coming years. So why? Um, how do we compete in the most intense environment? Uh, so just to stop you, just to make sure I understand. So it's not coming from price increases. No. It's actually coming from price decreases on average because you're going out to new Holding distributors. Holding the price at exactly at $14.99, incentivizing the, our partners in the traditional cable satellite telco business with penetration and scale, their net effective rates go down and keeping our retail price at $14.99 in, in the digital universe. None of this would matter if the product weren't good, right? And so I think people, you know, ask us all the time, well, you know, Netflix is spending this amount of money and Amazon is spending that amount of money and Hulu is spending money, everybody's spending money and everybody's competing and everybody's taking a page out of your book. That's all true. But our brand means something. Um, and it means 
to us the curation of excellence. And fortunately, it also means that to talented writers and producers and directors and actors who understand that it means something to be inside the HBO cocoon. And so I think, the, as I've said uh, before, and, and I think it has a virtue of truth, the best brand ambassadors for HBO uh, are not all of us in executive chairs. The best brand ambassadors for HBO are the talent. Because when people come inside the company to work, whether it's Nicole Kidman, Reese Witherspoon doing Big Little Lies, uh, a Steve Zalian who wrote The Night Of, or De Niro who did Wizard of Lies, uh, whoever it is, they have an experience because the marketing experience is bespoke, the promotion is bespoke, the development process is unique. They become a uh, kind of catalytic um, um, proselytizers for our brand, and that's infectious. So are you, that really is what brings the line at the door. So just so I totally understand, so are you saying that it's not just about money, and when folks say, hey, next year Netflix is going to spend $8 billion, you have $2.7 billion, I guess, this year to spend, you're saying De Niro and Reese are going to do business with you even if you pay them less than Netflix? No. Obviously, we have to pay competitively with the market, and we will. Um, what I'm saying to you is that when people have an experience of working in the company, I think it's differentiated. And if I was full of shit in saying that, and our team was full of shit in saying that, we would lose the opportunity to work with the next generation and the next group that's coming in the door. But what's happening is that the line at our door of talent is bigger as we sit here today in November uh, of 17 than it was last year or the year before. There's no shortage of people who are bringing us ideas. E every Friday in our, uh, in our company, we know of something we didn't know about the, the previous Monday. So we have to spend, and we're going to take some of this revenue growth that you spoke about and I spoke about a minute ago, and we're going to invest that more and more in content. Because the key for us is making sure that we have a product which is always reflective of the implicit promise we make to our consumer, which is you are going to get a kind of curated excellence in, across all genres, docus, half hours, late night, miniseries, hours, plus our four Hollywood studios. That we have to continue to deliver on. If we don't do that, then we don't deserve, and nor will we, continue to grow. But I like our batting average, I like our team, and I, I like the range of people who want to come work for us. That's, I think, our great advantage. So one mistake that I think a lot of analysts have made about the media industry is they've assumed that it is like the technology industry in which you have five ideas start at once, three years later there's one with 95% of the market, most of the others are toast, maybe somebody has some crumbs. In media, it's not a winner-take-all game. That's right. Multiple survive. Absolutely. You and Netflix are both crushing it. Right. But how many can crush it? Hulu has one, Amazon yeah. Prime, so many others. How many are, are going to survive? Uh, I don't know how many are going to survive, but I know that in a, I think there's so much, uh, there's such a surfeit of content out in the ecosystem. Just look at your own life, right? You you eat, I'm a junkie, um, uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a journalistic junkie, I'm a culture junkie. You can't see everything, right? Uh, I, I try to tap into competitors' work. I try to look at everything. There are some things I watch all the way through. But no matter how much time you have, and I do this for a living, you can't keep up with everything. So brands, amidst all that clutter, matter more than ever. And what our brand has, has always stood for and will continue to stand for is excellence and quality. And so if we do that, and if we keep delivering on that so that people recognize they may not love everything. I'm try, I've said before, I'm trying to build addicts. And I want people addicted to something every week. And they come in, they watch John Oliver, they get excited, they come back and they say, I miss the deuce, I miss Big Little Lies, I miss Curb, uh, I'm going to go over here and, and watch Insecure. Once we get them into the house, 
we think that becomes a very engaging and dynamic experience. And what, what we're seeing is less churn, more engagement, more subscriber satisfaction, and we want to put our foot on the accelerator and do more of that. For us, for me, I, I, I want us never, to your question about money, I want us never to have to say no to what we want to say yes to. And that's my marker. Just, we don't have to say yes to everything. We're not going to have every great show. I've said, I, I say this when I talk to Ted Sarandis. I say this when I talk to Les. I say this when I talk to companies. Crown's great. Good for you. Stranger Things is great. Good for you. Do you think that takes anything away from Westworld, the biggest first year show in the history of HBO? You think that takes anything away from Big Little Lies, from The Night Of, uh, from, from Thrones? Of course not. It, did, did you want to say yes to The Lord of the Rings before Amazon came in and paid $200 million? No, and, right? I'll, no, and I'll tell you why. Um, because we are working on a number of prequels to Thrones. We have one, two, three, four, five separate uh, Bibles that have been submitted, a couple of them that we're particularly high on. I'd rather own our IP 100%, like we do with Thrones, and I'd rather have the ability to work with a product that is inextricably linked to our brand and then monetize that out across the world. So if I have to make a bet on a genre piece, I'm going to go with a Game of Thrones prequel. I'm going to go with a Game of Thrones prequel that is part of our brand uh, uh, Halo. And we felt very comfortable with that decision. So you disagree with folks who say that now that Game of Thrones is ending, you're toast. Well, that, I mean, look, that's kind of, I mean, when I got, had my old job um, in 07, I became co-president, and I sat at the television critics, uh, my first television critics thing, and the first question was, just a bit of that tone, um, which was, uh, oh, <laughs> Sopranos, off the air, sex in the city, you guys suck. Um, the Times wrote a piece five minutes after I got my old job that said HBO's competitors say they've stumbled with a particularly shitty picture of me up in the right-hand corner of the New York business section of the New York Times. And um, we just said, look, we're going to roll up our sleeves. There's never going to be another Sopranos. There's never going to be another. But what there's going to be is the next great creative idea. And in came Alan Ball with True Blood. And in came this young lady who had never done a TV show in her life named Lena Dunham called Girls. And in came Armando Iannucci with a parody and a satire in American politics called Veep. And there came Mike Judge with this idea to take a look at the preciousness of the, of the tech world and, and do Silicon Valley. And then there were these two guys who had never done a TV show in their life, right? Who had very, very, almost no experience in the entertainment industry, pitching a fantasy show with dragons to us. And we believed in them, and we bet on them, and it was a good bet. And so the key for us is, are we a magnet for the next great writers? I, I think we are like a gallery, right? We are like an art gallery. And we want to be the place where the best artists want to hang their stuff. You're going to have emerging artists. You have contemporary artists. You're going to have masters. Uh, you're going to point to this. You're going to have all kinds of different painters. The, the, our job is to make that our environment exciting for them and dynamic for them and addictive for them. And I think the fact that we've done that, um, don't trust me, listen to them, is the reason the line is as big as it is and the reason we're so excited about the next generation of shows um, that are currently being produced, developed, and made. So what is the next Game of Thrones then? Is it Westworld? You mentioned Well, that. again, I'd, I'd give you the exact, I think Westworld's fantastic. Westworld, by the way, is double the number in its first year on HBO, 13 million, that Game of Thrones was in its first year, just so we're clear. Um, and there, when people get into this, what's the, you know, Bill Goldman, uh, the great writer of uh, All the President's Men and Butch Cassidy, he had this wonderful line about our business, which, has the, which is true, which is nobody knows anything. And, and there, there's, there's a great deal of veracity to that. What you know is that you are working with people with whom you have a shared vision and whose voice you trust. 
And then you're making bets on the writers and the talent that come in. Nick Pizzolatto, who did True Detective, has just written the first five scripts of season three, and they're fantastic. And the Big Little Lies guys, David Kelly, who's a master, has written the next iteration of Big Little Lies. And Steve Zalian is out working on The Night Of. And I told you about the prequel. One of them is being written by a guy called Brian Cogman, who was an apprentice of David and Dan, and then became one of the leading writers on the show. Um, uh, Jesse Armstrong, um, produced by Frank Rich, has written a show called Succession. Um, starring Brian Cox, which is the story of a media, Canadian media potentate who's turning 80. It's not meant to be, um, you know, it's not about anybody, but it's, it's, um, it's about a potentate who's meant to give his empire over to his second oldest son on his 80th birthday, changes his mind, the Faustian nature of power, stories of fathers and sons, families, I just kind of s dynasty for smart people is one way to, to look at the show. So we have this, uh, uh, a young writer uh, named Nisha Green is adopting the, the, seri the, the, the uh, literary series Lovecraft, uh, which is horror noir in, in the 1950s in the South, which I think is maybe the best first script we've seen in, in a long time, Damon, with J.J. Abrams. Damon Lindelof is doing Watchman. So I don't know which one of those turns into to, to gold. They may all turn into gold. But we're working with people we believe in. We're working with people who we have a kind of shorthand with. And um, that's how we do it. And we trust that. If nobody knows anything, and Netflix is now able to spend more than twice as much money as you can spend, Amazon, who knows? Well, let's not overdo the Bill Goldman no, quote, no, okay? <laughs> I, I think, I think, I think, what, I think the, what, what Bill Goldman, let's just be clear on this, is important. What Goldman was saying was, no one knows when something is gonna hit the zeitgeist in the way that Sopranos did, in the way that Thrones did. Let me be clear, because I was in the room, uh, any, and I, had to make the throne. Anyone who tells you we knew that Thrones was going to be Thrones is completely full of shit. Okay? You don't know that. You just know these are great storytellers. They're working off great IP, which is George R. Martin's extraordinary books. And you got an unbelievable team of producers and, and, and talented filmmakers. Let's make the bet. So you do know something which is that you're working with talent that you believe in and you're telling a story that you think is gonna resonate. That it, that it hits that part of the cultural imagination in that way, nobody knows that. So don't, it, don't, it can't be so reductive that you know, we're just sitting here throwing darts against the board. That's, that's not right. What we're saying is you never know where the next great thing is. So what you wanna do is work across the canvas with a wide range of talent and if you make enough bets, you're going to hit the kinds of gold that I think are, if you look at us over the last decade, we have a pretty good batting average of hitting. Some years ago, when Netflix made its first big bet, $100 million for House of Cards, everyone said, oh, it's just ridiculous, it's gonna bomb, turned out to be a huge home run. I gather Jeff right. Bezos said recently, I want a Game of Thrones, and he came up with Lord, Lord of the Rings. Yeah. You took a good look at it, Amazon has paid, again, reportedly 200 to 250 million for it. Is this a house of cards or is it a Marco Polo? Nobody knows, but um, if I'm Jeff Bezos, um, that's monopoly money. So, you know, he, he, he wants to make a bet on a great franchise, which by the way, um, our, our cousins at Warner Brothers, you know, have a, have a piece of. Um, that's a, that's a good bet. Why not make that bet? We don't need to make that bet because we have something quite precious, which is a franchise called Game of Thrones, and we're not manufacturing a creative idea with the prequel. The creative idea is coming to us with energy and vision from the creative team, from Brian Cogman, who's been a part of this the whole time. We're not going out and saying, you know what, go find us a prequel to Game of Thrones. They're coming to us and saying, we have an idea. And then another team's coming in and saying, so do we. So we've let a thousand flowers bloom in terms of uh, uh, the pilot process. And I think, you know, we'll probably get a couple of very good ideas out of that. So 
Another trend that's become clear over the last decade is just what an international business this is. You now have, I think, 130 million subscribers? 135, yeah. 135 million around the world. Take us ahead five, 10 years. How big can HBO, how big could Netflix get? Are we still looking at this and saying, hey, wait a minute, it's going to cap around 150, 200 million people, or, or a billion people? Is that a, is that a, a possible? Well, look, first, you got to walk the cat back just a little bit to our international strategy, which is different than Netflix's international strategy for decidedly um, important reasons. We um, have networks in 60 countries, um, in Latin America, in, in Asia, uh, and in Eastern Europe. And then we have licensing deals in about 130 countries. And then we have particular arrangements in very big markets like England and Germany and Canada and Australia, where uh, in se 17 separate countries where we have what's called home of HBO deals. So we lend our name and it's Sky Atlantic, home of HBO in, 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 in Great Britain, um, Sky Italia, home of HBO in, in Italy. Those are very, very high margin, low risk revenue deals. And we have them going out you know, for the next three, four years. And then we have an OTT business because we will have one global platform um, by by next year, and our OTT business in Nordics and Spain and elsewhere is growing as well. And so what we're gonna do over the next couple of years is we're gonna look at each market, and we're gonna make a decision whether or not it's smarter for us to build OTT businesses, because we own our own content, in more countries than we have them, or whether the licensing deals that we're doing in those countries where the price of content, as you know, is going up, our deals have great margins, they're going up, um, and so we're just looking market by market and deciding where the profits are and where the great long range plan is. If I were betting, I would think you would see more and more OTT, um, but um, we're gonna take it on a case by, case by case basis. How big can it go? Content, with, this is interesting parenthetical by the way. In each country, indigenous programming even in our networks businesses, indigenous programming made in Brazil, made in Argentina, made in Singapore, made in Malaysia, right, outperforms even our programming, even Thrones, even Westworld, sometimes by two to three to one. So we have raised our budget in OP around the world by 22, 23%. And we're doing more and more original programming, leaving the kind of patina of HBO in the hands of our local uh, partners in our local offices because we're watching how well that programming is doing. So the key there, just like here, is differentiated content that resonates in that marketplace. What we wanted to build internationally, this is important, is the same thing we wanted to build domestically. Optionality for the consumer. So as we saw that broadband only audience rising, we said this is not that complicated. It was five million then, it was eight and a half million when I stood on stage in Cupertino and announced our deal with Apple. It's 19 and a half million or so right now, 19 million. And we're growing very robustly in that market. But, but the large preponderance of people are still watching through cable, satellite, and telco packages. So we want to be there as well. And remember, we weren't fully penetrated. Basic cable networks were largely fully penetrated. We had a very low penetration rate. And so as those packages began to uh, break up, that was actually a good thing for HBO because buying HBO off 60 or $70 package, skinnier bundle, was better than having to buy it off a $100, $110 package. Same, same thing is true around the globe. We want optionality there too. So the reason we enhanced our technology, the reason we built a big office in Seattle, the reason we have world-class engineers working for us now is so we had that flexibility uh, and dexterity to move uh, however we wanted to. So your parent company is in the midst of purgatory and this big deal that trying to do with AT&T. Can you tell us what's going to happen? Yeah, I am. You know, look, um, I know what basically what you know from reading uh, the papers. Um, you know, there'll apparently be uh, a case. Um, you know the arguments as well as I do. There's never been a vertical merger. Uh, in 40 years, which uh, has been upended. Um, I would say, um, just speaking from the HBO chair, that one of these theories that I've heard, which is that somehow 
the price, uh, AT&T is going to raise the price uh, of HBO for its competitors, is, would be so diseconomic. I just told you how we grew the business over the last year and a half, two years. Be so diseconomic for us to do that or to step on our toes by creating um, disincentives for Comcast or for Spectrum or for Verizon uh, or for Dish or for anybody else. Uh, not to mention what it would do to the exponential growth of our digital business. So we have strove to do the exact opposite. We have strove to motivate them to lower prices, not to raise prices, because we saw growth in scale and in penetration, not in price increases. So I'm having a little bit of trouble getting my arms around that theory of the case. That's from our chair. I don't see um, how that makes sense, but you know, that, that, that will be, you know. And you know. anecdotally, to support your argument, in fact, ask you another question is, I was on the phone with my AT&T wireless representatives, perhaps less somewhere around a year ago, and they said, oh, we were talking about my bill. And they said, well, wouldn't you like our new plan, which is considerably less expensive than the one you're playing? And by the way, we'll give you HBO for free. So that's not a bad price. How much do you get of that? How does that well, work? Well, it, it, it is not for free uh, to you. them to us. Right. Exactly. We're getting paid. As I, Godfather too. Hyman Roth always makes money for his partners. Um, we always make money for our partners. And um, they have to pay us the wholesale price that we've agreed to as their penetration. Look, the deal that we did with AT&T uh, in the summer uh, of 2016, the HBO deal with AT&T, had a couple of very central tenants in it which punctuate everything I just said to you. We said to them, look, you guys are penetrating somewhere in the high 30s. Direct TV, which you've just bought, is not doing as well. Let's build some incentives for you guys to get up above 50%. And I don't care if you sell it here. I don't care if you sell it on direct TV now. I don't care if you sell it on direct TV. Let's get you guys motivated to package and market HBO. And as you do, your price will go down. And that's the deal that we did with AT&T. That's a good deal for AT&T, that's a good deal for the consumer, and that's a good deal for HBO. And if they want to market it that way, we can't control the retail uh, price or the retail strategy of our partners. We can the wholesale price, and that's the deal we built for them. They're doing that now. And to finish my personal anecdote, we have HBO from our cable provider in the living room, and now I get HBO for free from AT&T. Are you getting paid twice for me? Sure, thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> that is a good business. Richard, thank you so much. A pleasure. Great to have you. Nice to be here. Thank you all. Thank you very much. <laughs>